welcome to the CG Pro Podcast. This is episode 40. And tonight, our special guest is Sean Spitzer from Epic Games. I will introduce Sean in a second. Um, if you enjoy this evening, you can follow us at becomecgpro.com or in our Facebook group. Um, so yeah, tonight, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Sean Spitzer. He is a senior instructor and master mentor um, in virtual production at Epic Games. Um, he has had a lot to do with fellowships and all kinds of cool stuff. He's had a, a very interesting career and we'll get into that in a second. But um, Sean, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, no problem, man. Hope everybody's doing good out there in the interwebs. <laughs> I've only yeah. done these a few times, but uh, getting used to uh, the dynamic and streaming, I'm going to be hip eventually one day. Yeah, uh, I, I think so. Um, I feel like <laughs> I live on these things now, so <laughs> nice, I'm still, nice. I still feel like I'm getting used to it. But yeah, great to have you on. Um, so I always like to, to start this off just to kind of ask a little bit about your your origin story if you like like what what were some early experiences that you had that made gave you an indication that you wanted to dive into this crazy industry and oh uh, wow man um really just watching a lot of the shorts that come out around i'm gonna age myself a bit here uh in the 90s is when i started getting interested in deciding where my path was in college um seen a lot of the 3d shorts you'd see like pixar i didn't even know they were pixar I didn't even know their ilm at the time which was part of pixar and they inspired me and i've always wanted to tell stories always wanted to tell stories my path was a little bit weird to getting into the industry because i was in the family where my father would tell me you ain't gonna make any money at, you know, at CG, 3D, whatever it is you want to do. It's not a real job. Yeah. I mean, when I started, it was like, yeah, it's not a real job. It was like graphic arts. That's the only way they could explain it was graphic arts in some level. And um, and he might have been a little bit right at that because it was in its infancy. <clears throat> but as it started to grow and I found my path in college and because uh, I was going to go to Stanford. I was actually going to go to Stanford to be a lawyer. And I was at uh, Cal State Hayward trying to get ready to go that path. And I'd come home and see all my art on the wall, all over the place. And I knew I wanted to get into 3D and I knew I wanted to be a part of that. And I was a huge gamer. I was a huge animation buff. I loved animation every way, shape or form. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I switched to San Jose State, like two classes from finishing the uh, English degree, the emphasis in linguistics. And uh, I decided I would switch and go to uh, San Jose. And those were the early days. I mean, I got to say, looking at all the CG that was early coming out in the 90s and then seeing the animation and seeing that path. And I knew that's what I wanted to do, whether it was a games track to get me there. I wanted to be a part of that creative process and working in digital computers and stuff. Very cool. Yeah, it's funny because some of the early visual effects studios were actually games companies, <laughs> like people that did visual effects in movies. They, they had to leverage that because no one else was doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Lomo Man. It was done by a games company, you know, stuff like that. Crazy. Yeah. So you went, you went to college, you studied. What did you study? So when I was at San Jose State, I studied computers and arts. So they had, hmm. a, they had a program called the Cadre program. It was computers and arts and something i forget the whole acronym um, design and and uh i went that path is very experimental so we actually were really well rounded in the fact that we learned how to rig how to animate how to build websites using javascript all that kind of stuff and it was just all kind of uh really experimental in the fact that the way the curriculum was run was you had your hands in all the different pots so it was really a good place for me to jump off and become a generalist because in my day and age, generalists were huge. Yep. And they were like, because you had to know how to do everything. And while I was still in college, I had gotten hired by this small company called Mega Media, super small. And they wanted to work on a fighting game. And they wanted me to design the characters and help animate and have them come to life. And I was ecstatic. I thought that would be awesome. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's interesting you mentioned that because... Um, the generalist thing, because at the beginning of my career and 15 years ago, I was all kind of almost forced to become a specialist or try, people tried. I wanted to be a generalist and it was at a time where it become like a lot, a lot of production lines had become over time. They become more specialized and more efficient and et cetera. But the time, but as you said, back in the day with games companies were small. They had a few people that did all the things. My, my friend worked on 
in a games company did the sound and texturing and you know, all sorts of radically different stuff um and film became quite uh in the same way but uh it feels like is it's now we're now seeing a kind of renaissance of of the generalist no i was just gonna say that <clears throat> i feel like it's gone full circle um it started to started to pick up around 2000 uh, i think uh, 18 when you saw the generalist even a little earlier than that but now it's like full steam because there's a lot of people wanting to start their own game companies and they get the, the generalist in, in there and get people embedded in there that can do all hands that can do whatever it is is needed groundwork and then also an icv effects like the demand in icv effects is huge right now and you guys know this with virtual yeah. production classes you teach it's just it's big like there's there's not enough people to fill the gaps and getting people trained is is, is really important i've always loved that epic has always kept that on the forefront of keeping that not getting that knowledge out there absolutely yeah i mean they they really do they've invested a lot of time i'm going to close any erroneous stuff that i have so i don't have any of that just in case all good all good no this is a uh, one of the joys of a live podcast <laughs> we are live. We're, we're somewhere different today. We're actually in the conference room of Lux Machina. I just stepped off stage doing a panel, and uh, here we are five minutes later. Where's we're doing the where's podcast. that? Where's that one located? This particular this, office. Uh, the downtown um, LA and the oh, nice. district. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So, so early days for you. You were you started in in games, in the games industry. Yeah, yeah. So I started a small company called Mega Media. I worked there for a few years. Had the really awesome privilege to work with uh, John Gerard Mobius. And if anybody's a comic book nerd mm. and, and know this guy, he was the designer for The Fifth Element. He designed a lot of the the look and the feel for the whole visual place. And in my 20s, that was awesome because I That's was so really cool. stoked about it. Yeah, because we worked on a, a arcade-based game that Sony was making, and they hired us to be able to work on it. And I had a chance to sit there. We were actually drawing with him. Can't say wow. my drawings were great because when you compare your drawings to, next to him, George, George, <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, but it was really great to be able to have that opportunity. Uh, Sony used to fly us out. We would work a little bit and go back. And eventually Sony, Sony realized that our engine wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. And uh, so they ended up like, I think they started, they used some of our technology, then they finished off the game themselves. But we got to work on it for a bit and got to work with him, which was pretty cool. Wow, that's amazing. What, uh, yeah, tell me, tell me more. What was that like? What, what did you learn from somebody oh, of, of that level? Geez, uh, that guy, it, the thing about him, which was really interesting, because you're taking a comic book guy and you're putting him in a, into a game area. And it's funny because when you take someone who's out of their element, and we're getting this right now when it comes to film into real time. They, when the combo guy doesn't know what the limitations of real time is, it always comes down to that, right? Um, and they want to throw everything at it. So this comic book guy mm -hmm. is saying like, hey, can we get out of this? Because we're doing this. You would drive your vehicle and collect like gold or some if some sort of bacalite, I think was the name of it. And you would collect it in your, ve in your vehicle on this alien planet. And when <laughs> and he's all, at one moment, he's all, you got to have it so, he's very hippie-ish. And he's all, you open up your pod and you float around and you touch the gold. It was just such a funny moment because the art director looked at us and like, he's saying, what the, <laughs> yeah, right? we, we couldn't do any of that in the nineties. You couldn't do any of that. It was so funny. And uh, cause he was still describing and the art director just literally just turned around his seat and looked at the art team. And it was pretty funny. He's like, what's happening. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of like, even that comes with film that are kind of doing, if I can do a comparable film kind of has the same thing where they're like, Hey, I'm going to throw, cause they're used to offline renders and they want to put everything in unreal and figure it, just make it go afterwards. So the restraints we had to like kind of pull him in. And then the same thing too, with some of our clients that were like, Hey, this is what unreal can do. We have to obey these rules because then you can get what you need at a lower cost. You don't have to spend all day rendering. And in video games, obviously, what's the most important things that you have in the scene. Those are the priority. Those are the hero objects you want to focus on. And it was kind of funny because uh, trying to get the comic book guy fitting into that was pretty hilarious. And eventually, um, yeah, I mean, we, we worked on it for a bit and then we moved on to another project, but that was actually really cool. That was a really huge learning experience. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool to, to have 
things that are impossible to be done, but to to dream. You know, that's I always felt like science fiction is the vision of the future that you want to make, but when you can't practically, and then you have to wait for a, a bunch of time for it to become possible. Kind of like you know what you're describing, really, with with computer graphics. Like it couldn't be done at the time, but now, arguably, probably a lot of that can. Yeah, real time is just going to get better and better. It's just going to get. I mean, I obviously can't talk about all the new th cool things that are coming, but there's just just hold on to your seat. That's all I have to say. The things that Epic Games is going to do is going to be amazing. It just gets better and better. It's really exciting. Yeah, it's so cool. I mean, I, I've been. It's been thrilling to to be a part of it um, as a as a person using it. Um, I haven't been in the games industry myself, but mostly in film and using, starting to use game engines to make films. Um, but it's it's really the quality that's started to appear that's now attracting all sorts of people. It's, it's influencing the games world, but it's also attracting more and more um, people from the film world uh, into it because of the quality level, yeah. because the quality is so high. And the nice thing too is like you jump in and you can start to get you can start to get rolling. Now, obviously, Unreal has a learning curve, like all software does. But the fact that I mean, the one thing, and I was talking to one of our clients today about this. The one thing that's really huge is the lighting. You can get in, you can build your light really quickly, and you can get an amazing scene. And that's one thing Ep Epic Games, the Unreal Engine, has done so well for so long. And yep. I love, I'm all about the lighting. <laughs> I'm all about getting the lighting, working the lighting. And the way that we do it and the way that we handle it is just, I really feel out of all the engines are kind of unmatched. Just the yeah. ease of use and to get it done. And it's just phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible that you can literally now start up. There's a lot of great samples that you can start from, but literally with the, like the environment light mixer, a few clicks and you've got a whole real realistic sky with volumetric clouds and light that reacts to everything I, I remember starting lighting in my beginning of my career and i thought i was just terrible at it this was before linear so it was really really hard to do anyway um but yeah it's i just thought i was not good at it and it was so kind of abstract you had to put all these lights in to fake the effects of like big domes of spotlights and if you remember that like oh yes trying to, yes trying to, Yes. Go around and adjust all the colors of them. I used to teach my students that we used a mail script or something and we would build right. the dome of lights and in Maya and we would adjust it. And that was like on the very beginning of uh, image based lighting. Like you would imitate, you would use that plus you would use some image based lighting. Um, I can't even remember, man. It's been so long. But you would combo <laughs> that for certain shots and for certain things. And I had to teach the students that. And that was crazy. Yeah, and it was really like it was trying to accomplish the effect of what it is that you can do with a single button click now. In and in and in, we've had that in offline visual effects for a little while, but the fact that you can now do it in real time and just mm. open a scene, click a couple of buttons, yep. and then get going. I mean, there's still a lot of work after that that you need to do, but yeah, but you also on the plus side too, you don't have to render for like four or five hours. You no, know? I yeah, mean, that's right. I, it, it's just you know. Sometimes you would render. I remember I had an architectural client a while back and <laughs> it was rendering for a couple of days because it was all bouncing light, global illumination. And now that I look back at that, if I did that in Unreal, I could use twin motion if I really wanted to. And I could use Unreal and I could touch it up in Unreal if I wanted. It just two days yeah. of rendering. Yeah, just crazy. My, the story I was tell people from my begin, beginning of my career when I, I had uh, became a visual effects supervisor by accident, uh, very far too early. Um, and I, I had a city scene to do and it was really big. And the, I, I had to put it on the farm and it's, it was a week. I looked at the render farm. It said it's a week before you get your imagery back. And I had to tell my producer that. And he said, he didn't say anything. His face just went white because he just told the client that they could probably see something in a couple of days, <laughs> like a week. And and it didn't it didn't look as any it didn't look anywhere near as good as the Matrix City sample that now can run in real time on a laptop. Crazy. Which, yeah, it's how far we've come. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. Now, I, the first some of the first real time renders I did for visual effects. Like seeing it render, I thought it was a mistake. I thought I hit render and I was like, oh, it's just opened up a new viewport. But no, no, it's rendering. I'm like, 
that that just made me realize I didn't want to go back. You know, even though obviously visual effects and offline is still a thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the the advantages are huge. And um, tell tell me about some of the things that that you've enjoyed about um, the kind of the advent of real time in in film. So at some point, maybe first, like you could you could talk about um, how you transitioned from from games because um, now you're leading virtual production training and mentoring. Um, what were some of your experiences in in film and virtual production? Oh man. Um, so when I started, started out in games and then later on, I, uh, started my own outsourcing company and we did, yeah. uh, and that's where we kind of get onto the commercial space where we're doing commercials, TVs, uh, TV shows, a lot of TV show pitches. Like I've pitched the Disney <laughs> cartoon network, Warner brothers. We were doing that on a constant basis, <clears throat> got expensive after a while. Cause they kept telling us to change things. That means I had to pay more artists to change some things to get, go back to them. So there was times where I was like, I uh, not, can't yeah, we'll go back. We'll try that next year. Um, but there was a lot of that transition. Cause I was doing outsourcing for um, it's back when the casual game boom was taken off. So we had outsourcing for several different clients. Like I win and um, I can't remember the other ones and, Oh, geez. Uh, 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 oh, uh, uh, Zynga. <laughs> I almost <laughs> forgot. So there was a bunch of different ones. We were shuffling at the same time doing the commercial work. And we were doing a lot. A lot of our commercial work was fo focused on South America. So we did like I, I would I would contract people to do rigging and animation for commercials out there because I had a business partner. We had a branch in here in California, and then we had a branch in Brazil. So we were balancing the clients back and forth. So that's kind of when I started changing my focus from games to doing more commercial work. And I started doing more TV and animation and on the small screen. And then eventually I ended up finding myself uh, as art director for a broadcast uh, sports company, SMT. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot there, learned a lot there. Um, I, I, I think I pretty much was out of my depth at first when I got in there, I was like, what's happening? And, uh, but I did learn a lot. It was a learning experience. And then eventually I moved on to unity and there I was a senior artist and we did, uh, AR VR stuff. So mostly AR. So we were focusing on that, getting that stuff packaged and, and working with their, uh, with their ads and working with the experimental side of the engine. There was a whole bunch of really cool stuff we did. There was, that was a short stint. That was about maybe almost a year. But that was actually really cool. I learned a lot from there. And then I, and then I found myself working for Unit 9 Films. That was ARVR also. Guardian Airwaves was heavy working in, um, uh, in VR. So we were working on a VR concepts. And then eventually I found myself at Epic Games. And they saw that I had like a, a, a pretty good rounded uh, um, a list of things that they could push me and pull me into the uh, virtual production space. And uh, that was great, man. That because Epic Games was my bucket list company. Like Unity was one of them, but Epic Games. When oh, I was like, yes, Epic Games. Because there was a, a year, a few years back, where I was interviewing with them to be an evangelist, but I mm. had to say no because it was seventy percent travel, mm. and uh, my mom's health wasn't really great, so I couldn't do it. I just couldn't, in my right mind, I couldn't. I didn't want to be in Australia and hearing my mom's, in, you know, in the hospital. Or something. She's doing right. much better now. She's doing fantastic Good. now. But uh, at the time, I was like, it was the hardest decision because I really wanted it really bad. And so I ended up uh, coming back to that full circle. And then I ended up finding myself at Epic Games and they're like, Sean, you want to join us and teach uh, uh, virtual production? You want to teach uh, Final Pixel? Do you want to teach game companies? Just overall get people geared up for the massive wave of information we're throwing out in the audience. And I'm all, count me in. This is great. Because as I ran my company, I was teaching part time because I've always loved teaching. Always mm -hmm. loved. I had that one professor in college that fired me up. Like he made teaching cool. And I said to myself, one day, even part time, if I have to, one day I'm going to be able to, I'm going to teach. I want to teach at a university. So I taught at the Art Institute and the Academy of Arts. So they will leverage that. They're like, look, he can teach. He has real world experience. Let's get him into this uh, new uh, training program we had. So I was all, all on that. That was fantastic. Amazing. So it's a perfect kind of combination of not often found skills in, in one person like having all that experience through games and through film and, and teaching and 
starting your, your own company. Uh, that's a, it's a lot of different things. Yeah, it was way cool. Um, I, I, I left the company right at the, at the right time when I took on that art director job for broadcast sports and then, uh, moved moved on from there. It was just super stressful at the time, uh, running the company and we were competing with China and Russia and we were getting our butts handed to us cause it, it was, uh, it was, it was a, a tough market. We were coming in with high quality, but we weren't coming in with cost. And everybody looked at cost over quality, which is a tricky thing when you're trying to do outsourcing. But I was, uh, that was just a great time to just switch over. And then that just brought me to the road of Epic Games, which is fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> what was the, I just going back to the, what you uh, mentioned in, in broadcast and the fact that that was really, you grew a lot and, um, and it was really hard. What was it about that environment that was such a kind of, uh, crucible. Like. Oh, uh, the time frames. Um, right. Because we would have a client, my buddy would reach out to me and say, Sean, we need a character completely rigged, set up, and we need it done. Can we do this in a month? And I would be teaching at the same time. It was also getting my master's. So I was running my company, getting my master's, and teaching at university. So I'm like, okay, let's see if we can do this. And that made it a little bit diff difficult. Broadcast is pretty crunchy. Like, you know, they need stuff quick mm -hmm. and fast. And then we were competing. So a lot of times we do the work and they would pay us later if they approved it or liked it. And sometimes we wouldn't even, we, it would just be a competition. We'd get it and we'd eat the cost because we'd be like, look what we can do in this small amount of time, almost like an art test in a way. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> that wasn't always like that, but that would happen. And that, that made it kind of, that made it kind of tricky. Um, that was, there was times where <laughs> I would be yelling at my riggers because they weren't listening and the animators on the other side, we kept breaking the rigs. So like we would get our riggers and our riggers, there'd be a point where we made it phenomenal. It was great. Unbreakable. Hand it over to the animator. Keeps grabbing the wrong control. Creeps grabbing. Like we didn't, the, it was kind of a combination of what the riggers should have locked down versus what the animator decided to break. And I'd be like, ah, and that was, that's probably the stressful part because we would have to fix it really quick, continue the shot and then still make it to our delivery date that we had to and that happens man because I, I break my own rigs all the time like i'll make a rig i'll break it that's that's I'm, I'm my worst enemy i'm a rigger and an animator break my stuff <laughs> <laughs> you know how to break it the best when it, when you made it <laughs> yeah <clears throat> that's yeah so essentially it being rapid turnovers and not having enough time to really like what you would have the luxury of in in film or maybe a long term game project as there was like long um lots of of short gigs basically so it was yeah. like it really made you sharpen up yeah yeah when i was uh there was a small company i worked for a while back and it was um oh, what's the name of it interplay so interplay we did uh some animation for uh what was the game i'm going to age myself run like hell it was like a small survival sci-fi game that came up a while back and we did like a bunch of the animations but we had the we had time we had time they gave us a deadline we knew what the deadline was coming and and the tricky thing with broadcast you know it but you're competing sometimes and you also have another one like you said you have another client or you have another project right behind stacked on top of that one and it's super stressful because you're like, I got to get this done. I got to do this. Or you're managing several. In games, it can be a bit more linear where you know what you have to get done. You have to get it done. And the hard part you can run into is just the changes, the person paying the check, the changes that they make versus, you know, I, I got to I gotta keep rolling through the clients. I got to keep going through it. And that's that's the tricky part, too. So, yeah, no, I hear you. It's it's. um the dynamic it, it kind of depends on the studio but the dynamic is can be very different in some cases right now those is part of the reason why in, i wanted to go into commercials even my dream was film but i wanted to go into commercials because i wanted that fast turnover i wanted to learn i wanted to do lots of things in short succession and that was a good solution to that at the time um but yes yeah, so it, it seems like now um Virtual production is now kind of bringing that into the film world almost. It's creating that kind of ability to be able to w iterate more quickly and work on more. And and um, why do you think it's it's why do you think that generalists are more popular now? Become become more in vogue. 
Um, I think because there's uh, particularly, I guess, um, are you, are you saying like with games or ICV effects? Because there is kind of like a little bit of two different answers. Yeah. With that. Um, in well, games, probably in games, I think it's still more specialist in in a, in for the most part. Yeah, but, yeah. Mm. I mean, the generalists are there, and but it, most studios kind of want you to have some sort of focus. Um, there are the small startups though that they they love the generalists. They want you mm. to be there because they don't have the staff. For ICV effects, the reason why it's huge is because there's just not enough people that know enough about Unreal. And then when you have a generalist on set or you have a generalist that can, you know, if there's a lighting problem, he can solve it. But hey, there's a rigging problem. Oh, he can solve that. Oh, there's a rendering problem. Oh, he can solve that. So if he has those tools, I mean, that's that's just money for them. They love that because you're saving them time overall. Mm -hmm. And I think just because there's a gap, because in film, having Unreal is just so new. It's just so brand new out of the box. It's, it's a very uh, unusual territory. There was... One of our um, one of our uh, lab managers was telling us about a studio. I won't say its name, but this studio had no idea. They were so used to offline renderer, and they're like, "Why do we need to use Unreal? We don't want to. We don't want to use it. We don't understand it." <clears throat> and she basically told them, "Look, if you come in with a game plan and you know what you want, Unreal will do it. You just have to know what you want. It's not like Maya when you throw everything at it. You have to come in and figure where your shots are at and your object of interest." And that's the thing. Like we get these guys in there, they're thrown in the woods. And if they know it, if you're a generalist and you know what the director is going to change and you know Unreal's limitations, that is gold because you're helping him navigate. He's used to throwing everything, the kitchen sink and everything at my end. But then you got someone that can steer the reins. That's just priceless. What, what do you think um, makes a good generalist? Um really understanding and spending time for i i would say to start off how can i how did i start off with mine i've always focused in originally on animation and then eventually tiered into everything else what makes a good journalist is making sure that you understand what it is that you need to learn for that moment and digesting it correctly so that you can use it again the problem that can happen with a generalist is they can jump on something and learn it, do a Google search. Anybody can do a Google search. Do a Google search, fix it, and forget it. And then mm -hmm. you become kind of useless. Like you have to continue to go back. So when you're at that moment where you're learning that, that, that new skill, make notes for it, understand it, practice it, try to break it, try mm -hmm. to make it, push it to its limit. And I think that makes a really good generalist where you know exactly the ins and outs. Because the caveat, the, the worst thing that can happen is when you think you know how to do something and it breaks and you have no idea why it broke. And you're in that moment, either on stage or in a game studio, you cannot get past this wall. But if you spend some time unpacking it, you can easily figure it out if you just know what you did right versus you know, what exploded and caught, caught on fire on a dumpster down a hill into, you know, a pile of poo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful picture. <laughs> That's all I had. <laughs> Visually, I'm seeing it right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really, really, really interesting to hear because I think uh, a lot of people ask about that. You know, running a school, a lot of people ask what essentially what types of job are there and that's changed a lot over, over the time i've been doing com working in computer graphics um the industries have appeared and some have changed radically so often people ask still that question i asked that question at the beginning should i what should i do what do i want to do what, what should i specialize in people are telling me just i gotta pick one thing and do that and i didn't want to so commercials was then was my solution but uh, now there's more opportunity in, in other areas <clears throat> and virtual productions are really exciting one for the generalist and some yeah, it really is. yeah so it's good it's cool to hear about your your thoughts on what makes a good generalist or what qualities what are the qualities of a good generalist are there any um like recommendations what would you recommend to somebody if who wanted to become a, a good generalist things they could go through or yeah no problem um, one thing, if you're going to be a generalist, just make sure that uh, you can have focal areas. You can say, hey, I'm a generalist, but I do favor a particular area. And that actually can help people get grounded 
the worst thing is what do they say? You you know, um, when you have you have a thousand skills, but you're master of none or something like that. It's you know you don't want to be that that particular person. But if you if you find a focal area, and the focal area I've always found myself at, and it's so funny, is been uh, rigging and animation. But when I got to Epic, it's lighting and shaders. That's my specialty. Mm. So I've learned to transition. I've learned to go from one to the other. And I didn't pigeonhole myself. I didn't say that's all I wanted to do. So when a, when a, if you're starting out and you want to be a generalist, don't go into a studio that's hiring you as that type and say, I don't, I just want to clean windows. I don't want to do, you know, this over here, find yourself in that position where you're like, Hey, I I can do this, but I really am starting to get into this. And I would love to help you guys and find a problem, find a problem. If there's a problem that they're having a, they're having a hard time figuring something out. Like maybe they're having a hard time figuring out some shaders or maybe a control rig. They don't know how to use control rig. Dive in there and, and see if you can help them. Learn it as much as possible. Put your head together and you'll you'll get a family if you get a matrix of nerds of people to put your head together. If you solve something together, you can bond and you can actually become a better team overall. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I definitely echo that. I think that's how I kept my first job that I got was I kept my ear open to the room. And like if someone had a problem, because I got a two week gig at the beginning of my first job and I, I'd left my software engineering career for that. Uh, I, I had to keep this job. So I, I kept listening around the room for like, who's got a problem? If they had one, I'd go over and try and try and help them with it. Um, yeah. So And we became a really tight little family of like 10 3D people in the room. Um, awesome. You spend a lot of time with those people. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So you like helping helping others, being daring. Um, that's what I'm hearing. You know, be be willing to to try, be willing to try yeah. something out. Yeah, there'll be moments where I mean, you'll hit your head against the wall, but I mean, if you pile through, I mean, the payoff is going to be what not to do, right? <laughs> what not right. to do, what what to do right, and uh, also you'll you'll learn the limitations of a particular tech you're working with. And then that that can lead to a chain, like you said, someone overhearing saying, oh, well, let me write a tool for that, you know, and then it can just all kind of flow as long as you're communicating. And that's the one thing I find out with all the companies I've been with, large or small, communication is the key to get those things solved. And if you keep isolated and, and, and me as a trainer, <clears throat> I'm trying to bridge some of that at Epic Games because we're kind of a big but also kind of a small, in a way, company where people get focused. I mean, they're really focused on what they're doing. And I'll jump in and say, hey, what are you doing? Oh, what is this? How does this work? And I'll com compare notes. I'll try to bring people together. And we bond. It's like a really cool family. You start to say, look, man, I didn't know that exploded, but you but you found out it exploded. Let's figure out how we, you know, I was having a conversation with one of our technical account managers today about that, like, something in lighting like that 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 didn't quite come out the way i wanted let's try to fix it right no that's cool yeah being around other people who've got those skills and asking them questions and being willing to being open and willing to learn and being coachable and yeah it's like something guys again i did at the beginning was just basically ran around the company that we were in, like going, jumping into flame suites un, uninvited and saying, what are you doing? <laughs> Just trying to, <laughs> trying to learn as much as I could. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, really yeah. Cool. Um, so tell me, tell me about, uh, you've worked on some really cool stuff as well. Um, I know you did some stuff on love, death and robots. Yes. Uh, can you talk about that a little yes, bit? Yes. That was a learning experience, man. That was pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, cool we show. Were, yeah. yeah, it was great. We were working with uh, helping out Blur Studios, and they they pulled me in. They said, "Sean, we need some lighting, possible some shader work." So I jumped in on it. It was a really crazy week too, because it was a week where uh, I think my computer kept crashing. I had a brand new computer. I was like, "Oh, let's do this," but it kept getting in a crazy, crazy loop of uh, overheating. So I ended up using the Teradici machine, which saved the day. That was fantastic. And then like my apartment flooded. It was really kind of nuts. Wow. But I got some shots out, which was fantastic and working through all that. And working on that was fan that was really great because I learned a lot. The crunch mode was real. Like they were working on Saturdays and Sundays and they were pulling us in and uh, learning and pushing uh, Unreal to, to its limit and where it went where it could go and working with some really great solution architects and TAMs. 
And uh, it was phenomenal. It was really phenomenal. And what I learned from it was um, what not to do because um, so there were some things that people were learning, like we were helping them teach them what not to do. So we mm-hmm. were understanding what they were doing and how, and we try to guide them into a better workflow with Unreal. And the, the lighting on that is phenomenal. Like one mm-hmm. of my favorite lights, I already love this light. It's called a rec light we made. But I just really grew even more attached to it. Just being able to tweak it for the shots that I had were fantastic. I made that. Uh, there's a scene in the short where there's goo that the girl stabs a knife and pulls the goo. I made the goo. So that was <laughs> nice. that was my goo. I made that goo. Um, so that was actually really cool. And it just I, what I really did learn, though, is, is trying because – for me, the big hurdle that I ran into was I'm used to working in games. I'm used to working in commercial work. We had a we had a concept artist that would build it, make the concept art, and we would work off the concept art. Like you had a whole key shot. Like you had maybe maybe even several concept arts to work off of of how the lighting and everything was supposed to go. <clears throat> this was diving in, and they were like, "Look at the last shot to make this shot work." I'm like, ah. Like, I would be like, where's the concept art? I feel out of my element. And I was completely like, where is it? I need concept art. So that was tricky for me because I'm like, okay, I got to look at the last shot to make this shot work. So it was a lot of smoke and mirrors. So it's a lot of like, I'm going to make this, tweak this, move it around. And in games, you're set because it's a real-time interaction. So you're using this engine. So I was learning the ins and outs of, hey, this is not a set action. This is a shot. I, and that is funny because I was working in it. I had to remind myself because Unreal is just so great. And I'm so used to using it on the game stream of VR or whatever. And I'm using it now to do this final pixel work. And I was learning on a breakneck speed to get these lighting shots done super, super fast. And it was really cool. Learned a lot. Didn't sleep a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> just but got electrocuted there was a story with that where my apartment got <laughs> flooded that wasn't fun but uh yeah, i just it was great it was fantastic i love and got I, electrocuted you got flooded oh and- it flooded through the wall and it was it flooded through the wall and hit my power strip on my power strip like a champ survived but my feet were a little tingly for some reason <laughs> i just like ah, my feet feel really weird i was talking to my wife and i was like feel weird like it kind of feels burny or something <laughs> like that was the adrenaline was pumping. So if I got electrocuted, I probably didn't even notice. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was just like the bottom of my feet were not the same for like the rest of the week. It was pretty funny, but uh, I did not die. Thank God. <laughs> didn't die. Got the shots done. Yeah. I got the shots done. It was fantastic. <laughs> that feels like that should have been in the credits or something like thanks to Sean and his, and his poor feet for getting this movie made. <laughs> they just put in a sub clause. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Pretty, their ter- pretty, their ter- yeah. D2 machines were fantastic man that really saved saved things that was fantastic I had to right. bump up my internet for those suckers but they were great yeah yeah for sure it was amazing though that you can now do all this stuff remotely and we were it, we, in Lion King we were using remote machines that were halfway across LA and they were under the desk I'm currently using in San Francisco and they feel like they're under my desk because like, the internet's got got to that point i guess and the, the really interesting to me how unreal are really going after um epic or with unreal engine are going after the connectivity as well um there's something that's i think as uh, often people talk about the render speeds being really good but the the real time nature for me is really exciting that you can collaborate and work in real time i think that's something which doesn't ne- necessarily get spoken about as much no i hear um, you it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I, I, Jackie told me that Scott says, "I'd like to say thanks to Sean for trading my team back at the Sony WeWork." Hey, anytime, Scott. What company were you with? If you want to ping, but I just saw that real quick. The pop. I would give Scott props. Uh, so many companies that fly through. I want to make sure I get the right Scott. I don't get the last name, just to let you know. <laughs> uh, that might be that may be uh, Scott. That may be Scott Rosecrans. I don't know. From ah, anyway. Zoic. Yes. Yeah. What up, Scott? What's going on, man? I remember. Awesome. Yeah, Scott's a good friend and uh, teaches with us as well. Yeah, they do some amazing work as well. They're really pioneering in, in the space and they're doing kind of virtual production. When I came to America 10 years ago, that's like before people were talking about it for sure. 
really cool studio. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so what uh, what do you see in terms of the connectivity of the engine? How do you how do you see people um, picking that up these days? People collaborating across the internet and building building worlds together. Wow. Um, the the way that now, the way that things are going, I know that um, the metaverse is the huge thing, but I really see uh, <clears throat> Fortnite also being a, a big part of what they want to do and what, what they want to bring to the table to show everybody that you can build great things with it and you can do whatever you want. Like your imagination is unlimited, that we can bring that to it. And I think that's where things are going to go. We're going to be taking the engine and giving people and empowering them to make whatever they want to do. Whatever they want to, whatever they want to create, whether they're in Fortnite or whether they're in Unreal itself, they are all going to be able to build whatever they need and want. And, and obviously, as technology gets cheaper, computers get cheaper, GPU get, is going to be cheaper, and internet access is going to be faster and stronger. I mean, they're building, they're getting fiber all over the place. My buddy got fiber not too long ago, and he loves it. He's streaming super fast. So I think the connectivity plus the technology is going to make it so that you're going to see more video game companies popping up, like just ground, just groundbreaking, just people, like maybe a group of five, a group of 10, and you're going to see people <clears throat> with ICV effects, small studios popping up saying, look, you know, we want to do this. We can do a film because honestly, LED volumes are just going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. They really are. Yeah, it's an, an exciting time. The, first, the beginning, it's always really expensive, but things yeah, oh, geez, yeah, it's so expensive. To... <laughs> they told us how much we were renting it from uh, NEP Sweetwater, and I was like, "Holy crap!" Like <laughs> a lot of money. We have a, a few questions coming in from the crowd. Um, so, someone saying, um, "Could you kind of ask Sean how long his training usually takes when he teaches Unreal for other companies for virtual production?" No problem. So um, it kind of depends on what uh, the road or the track is. When it, If it's just a virtual class that we're teaching, it's about two hours. But if it's like an ICVFX training and it's on site, like we'll either train them at L. Right now, our school, our classroom, we used to have at Culver, but we moved our office. Now it's going to be at the LA lab. That one could be up to three hours uh, of training because it's a hands-on. So we want to show people, Hey, look, this is what you do when you're working with an LED volume and ICV effects. So it just kind of depends. ICV effects, if it's hands-on, it's going to be a little bit longer. If it's virtual, most of the time, that's just going to be like two hours. <clears throat> okay. Very cool. I got another couple of things, a couple of questions here. Um, Someone saying, um, what were the other programs used in the short? What was used to make Cthulhu? Um, I'm not really sure on the post, on anything post that they may have used, um, but I saw those shots and I, I literally saw in real time, like Cthulhu grabbing the post and leaning forward, the effects going off his eyes. Uh, most of what we worked on there <clears throat> at least the shots that I was messing with and working with was all unreal. And what you see is exactly what you see in the short. Like um, my shots were a death scene. One of the guys was getting eaten. I worked on part of that. And then there was, uh, again, like the goo stabbing it in the wall. All that was straight unreal. That was straight unreal. And uh, interacting, there's there's a, there's this one shot where the guy, and I show this to everybody all the time, when he's, I can't even... Uh, look it up right now but he's looking at the camera and he's looking up just before the bugs come down from the step all of that was unreal and you see that exact right. shot that i worked on inside the short so if there was any post stuff that was done other software programs i'm not sure what they were and from what i can tell because i saw it from beginning to end it wasn't a whole lot there was maybe some color correction maybe emphasizing contrast but i what we saw in Unreal was like 90% of what you saw in that short came directly from Unreal. Amazing. Yeah, really pioneering stuff. In fact, you can you can do it all in Unreal these days. Amazing. Yeah, yeah it's pretty crazy. Someone else is, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was going to say, when I saw some of the body scans that they did and they put them on and they put the actors in CG, that's when I was just like, oh, crap, this looks just like it's offline render. This is really great. <laughs> 
<laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, no problem. Um, uh, another question that's come in. Someone says, how long do you think it will take for Unreal to become fully integrated into the film industry? Interesting question. Wow, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, how long? How long, Sean? We need a number. <laughs> if I could do a clock. Um, <laughs> this really just depends on the studio because each studio has a different way, a different method of doing things, and different particular shots that they want to do. Honestly, there is uh, studios popping up all over the place that are doing ICV effects. And it also depends what they want to do. If they want to do final pixel, that's still considered the film industry. And then you have ICV effects with live actors, still considered the film industry. Um, I think final pixel might come around faster, possibly, um, because it's uh, a bit cheaper. But ICV effects, like I was uh, telling Ed, it's going to you know, the, the panels will eventually go down. They're just really expensive right now, but the cost will eventually go down on some level. <clears throat> and I'm say, I would say probably the only prediction I have is like, man, the next eight years are going to be a big changing game changers. And I think how things unfold, you're going to see the tech and people adopt real time because no one wants to wait days or hours for a render. If you can get it immediately quick and fast and just as beautiful, that's like, that's great. Yeah, influences the decision making too. You can sometimes you don't know until you see the render whether it, <laughs> whether it works, and now you can see it. You can the director can be there while you're doing it. Make yeah, that voice. yeah, I've seen those renders where you're like, I, I ran a again going back to the architectural client I had, ran the render, sent it out, got it back, <laughs> and render again. It's just the saddest thing. Right, it was like another couple of days. <laughs> Yeah, I had the same for my week long one. It was just, it was crippling. We doubled the render farm, sized the render farm to like 100 nodes instead of 50 to rent a whole bunch of machines. And then it brought it down to three or four days. That was still <laughs> not cool. Um, yeah, someone, somebody else is asking a question about AI, which is a hot topic right now. Um, so some, there's a couple of, couple of versions of it actually. Um, I'd love to know what you think about AI, how will it impact and be implemented into Unreal or overall, is it better or worse for the industry and, or in summary, tool or threat or both? No, I hear you. Um, I can't say how we're implementing or where we're implementing. I just can't talk to that. For um, sure. yeah. um, where it's going to go, I'm not really sure. I mean, I have a mixed feelings about it. I've used it to get quick ideas that I want to say, Hey, uh, I want to model something. I want to build something like I have several um, AI generated images that I want to eventually make th into 3d. I did it because, you know, something you know, I don't like, I feel creepy grabbing some, someone else's concept art, but at the same time, this AI made concept art and some depends what you get. Cause there's AIs that will actually grab copyright and stuff where they're more shady and you get ones that'll get open, uh, open source stuff. That's, uh, open to the masses and those are the ones I try to focus on so I have a mixed bag about it I only get it for for ideas to be able to do stuff but I don't try to marry exactly just because I don't want to cross that line of taking mm -hmm. someone's concept or someone's art because you always want to make sure you get the right AI that does that because there are AIs I think the Dolly one I'm not sure I think that one is more um, grabs, I'm not going to speak for it at all, but I think that one grabs more of the, uh, less of the copyright vein. <clears throat> the one that's been in the spotlight has been mid journey. And, uh, I think people have been complaining about that guy grabbing, uh, people's art. So I just do it to get ideas and concepts and whether, where it goes from here, I don't know, because there's a lot of legal, a lot of legal, um, maze and red tape that it's happening with that because i my artist friends some of them hate it and i don't blame them yeah. because you know the, you're taking bits and pieces of people's work and you're just kind of you're, you're duct taping them together but i've had people argue and say what's the difference between photo bashing they just having a computer photo bash for you so i don't know i try to stay out of it and i just get ideas and then i'll work on my own <laughs> right yeah makes sense it's, I know it's very different, but it sort of feels a little bit like the conversation that came up when samples became a thing. Like people are saying there's not real music or you can't like take that thing. And and, and it figured out the usage rights uh, in some way, although people were using it without permission. Like people could get paid for having samples and things. And there was a lot of controversy around 
sampling in the early days. I know yeah, this yeah, is yeah. very different. But then there's also um, uh, AI or machine learning, which is more typically what it is uh, for helping with something that's not stealing, where it's just tools, you know, things that yeah. are helping with processes like rotoscoping and things that a lot of people don't really like doing. <laughs> we're starting to see that that come in a lot more. I um, remember when I was at Unity, they were doing a lot of machine learning, and then they were exploring a bit of the AI front, probably not as heavy as they probably are now. But, I mean, yeah, it could be used to help mankind. <laughs> it could be used for evil, or it could be used for good. It just kind of depends what you want from it. Right. Yeah, it seems and, like it's not going away uh, at the very least. That GP chat is crazy. That that yeah. one makes me kind of nervous. I think it like passed the bar recently. Someone just submitted, took the bar test. Oh, just... not the Turing, the Turing test. Oh, was it the Turing? I forget was which it, one it was. It was that? I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. It was some sort of test, and like, hey, you're a doctor now or something. I don't know what it was, but it like took a test. Oh, and... I see. It yeah, passed yeah, an yeah. exam of some yeah. sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's like and it was AI did it. You really just think about it. That's just fancy Google because it had to look up all yeah. the answers. It didn't have it in its brain. <laughs> it seems um, hit past the bar. Someone was saying, um, "Yeah, it seems it seems like it's really uh, troubling Google at the moment. They seem really unsettled by it, and there's a lot of people out there saying that it's going to bring them down or whatever. We'll see, I guess. But it's it's these tools. I guess they're here. They're not going away. You know, we're gonna have to yeah. learn to live with our new robot overlords. <laughs> how do you, how do you see um, Unreal Engine affecting the the games industry? Oh man, your games are going to get more and more realistic. They're going to get more the the stylized ones you'll watch are going to be more vast and more big. That's what I feel. I feel it's just going to get so involved that you're going to be jumping into a game, whether it's VR or whether you're just sitting in front of your computer, it's going to look so beautiful. Like you look at, uh, you can look at some of the top tier games that are out right now and what they're doing. Like even the next Gears of War that's coming out is using our technology still. And it's just beautiful. Even the old one was beautiful. It was great. But now it's like going to get better and better and better. When you play a game and you see the pores on someone's face, that's just, mind-boggling awesome but things are getting that unique and so it's suspension of disbelief suspension of disbelief is just off the chart and i think that's where unreal is really going and you can see that even with the metahumans yeah <clears throat> and the, the lighting and reflection quality of the lighting particularly i think it was funny seeing when, when ray tracing first became a, a thing on graphics cards and lots of gamers seemed like they were saying i don't care it doesn't make any difference and like but now we're starting to see the real real benefits to games that the realism involved in them um like you feel like we're going to see more games that are exploring the idea of of a film like that's always been a thing in games they've always tried yeah. to tell stories yeah i think i think that bridge is gonna be uh it, it's gonna be yeah I, th I think just i'm trying to trying to figure what i can talk about yes <laughs> <laughs> yes. that's a safe that's a safe bet yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm trying not to ask you really specific no that's okay that's oh, okay yeah. um i was i was told to be uh yeah to be very strategic be yeah yeah <laughs> um there's a say there's a question what did jackie put in real time uh green screen or some type of ai compositing versus led screen final pixel thoughts on which one you think will be the moving forward honestly i i say ai is just way off still it's still get along i mean you can generate something it looks really fugly right now mm. it's got like Perfect. i love yeah i love how it messes up the fingers like everyone gets like twenty thousand fingers it's pretty funny so i think that's way off i think right now led is going to probably be the hot ticket but again, not everyone has the money or wants to spend the money for LED volumes. So there'll be a lot of people renting it or going if they use it. Um, green screen will be around for a while. Mm. Um, but uh, I don't think that's necessarily going away anytime soon. But LED there's is going to be a hot that, ticket for a while. There's some things that the green is just better at. Even take the cost out of the equation, like trying <clears> to put <throat> people's feet on the ground and, and a, on a virtual ground it's pretty yeah. hard to do that unless you, you build the art department in the foreground sure you can just film them being on the floor but if you want to put them on a virtual floor 
LED floors, no shadow, no reflections. Yeah. And then you'll see if you're not careful, you'll, you'll, you'll catch the, <laughs> where the floor meets the panel and you got to put a rock there, put a, put a tree yeah. there. So no one sees, you know, if you're not a careful. smoke machine in, blow yeah. some smoke in front of it. <laughs> no one saw that. No one saw where okay. the panel begins and the floor ends. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's interesting. Yeah. The, the, um, it's, it's fascinating to see how more uh, games companies are taking on Unreal Engine as well, that people are shifting away from their own proprietary engines and, and going going in on Unreal Engine, where they've had their own engine for 20 plus years in some cases. It's, re- it's cool to see. To me, it makes sense because uh, being able to leverage the might of Epic's engineering team means you can focus on the creative and the art and do a good job at that. And I got I got to give Epic kudos, man, because these guys are some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. These guys are so brilliant. I can talk to them, and they're they're personable. They want to help. Everybody's kind of invested in this in this beautiful product they have, and being able to work with them has just been a pleasure and a half, man. These guys are just so smart. And if it, there's times where I'm like I feel right at home, and then there's always that like. I, f- I feel so out of place. <laughs> Everybody's just so smart and so talented, but it, you're always going to feel that because there's just all sorts of different range of, of, of a caliber of people there, which makes it great. Cause we all learn from each other. We all grow and sharpen each other. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Well, you I always, I always feel like you don't want to be the smartest person in the room if you want to grow. So it's, it's true. Good to be yeah. around other, um, one other question, uh, someone saying, um, it'd be great to hear any tips about getting really s- good cinematic quality in ICVFX or virtual production. Um, one of the things, uh, and that's a, that's a big question. Like it's like a pageant question. There's like, that yeah. one is also based on what you want to do <laughs> and how you want to shoot it and how you want it visually look. The best tip I can say is get to know lighting really well. Lighting is going to be your best friend. In ICV effects, also get to know and understand how DMX works. And we're updating our docs on that, by the way. I'm actually working on a class with that. Um, so get to know how that system works too, because you want to be able to, if you do change your lights in your scene with your, your control, you're using like maybe a grandma system, a deck to be able to control things. You want to make sure that that light's talking to the correct one in your scene. You make sure that your lighting is working and when you are, when you want realism, to be honest with you, it is easier to do indoor shots versus exterior. Exteriors are tricky because you have you have that ceiling you have to deal with. You have to figure out: is this look like sunlight? Is your lights talking to your system the way that you want? Are you p- putting the light in the right spot, physically moving it on stage, and then controlling it the way that you need it and you want it? what you get it to do what you want to get the correct bounce. So interiors are easy because you can control that. And there's a lot of variables and the audience can be forgiving because, you know, they don't know if that light's bouncing off a white wall somewhere else. And, but when it comes to outdoor, everyone can spot when that outdoor is not looking so great. So just be very strategic with that, figure that out. I hope that helps. That's a lot I'm unpacking. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, it's like a whole six month class. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. creating good cinematics but it was some good tips there no i think my biggest takeaway from what you said there is just be be careful with what you try to accomplish and there are some things that are just really hard and you know know where you're at and and you know start with things that you can you can accomplish work up as an unreal engine is also evolving to to be better at some of the things that it hasn't been as good within the past like water and things that offline effects were bad at uh and took a long or well, so it took a long time to get better at i should say um but uh, i'm now on reels really getting really good at doing water and hair and all the sorts of things i just thought it yeah. would be impossible <laughs> like yeah it's, it's getting yeah. better and better um we're exploring that like we're working on a, a a project i can't talk about too much right now but we're trying to explore how to do a nice little pipeline with those kind of elements working with hair with a very a detailed set and on uh, just trying to figure that out and trying to just really bring we really do want to bring what the tools you guys get in film and bring that in that real-time space 
So it's completely accessible. We really want that because we want you guys to feel comfortable. And again, like I always say, I say it all the time, drunk with power. We want everyone drunk with power to be able to feel that they can do anything like the Lego box and you can do whatever you, whatever you can. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel that way with it. I think when I first, when I was a, when I was a kid and I was playing games like, um, populous and things like i don't know if you remember that but it was like a world building game and you could play god you could build landscapes and build little towns i remember that game (laughs) yeah it was super cool it was like wow i I did feel like flo was playing god in that sense but but that was so crude and then now we can build massive worlds in unreal engine like full scale real size with real physics Oh man, I just, <clears throat> and I love where Lumen is gone. Like Lumen is phenomenal. You get up and running like immediately and it's the lights are movable. Everything can be changed on the fly. It is so great. And it is basically a Lego box. And then you put that lighting frosting on top of it and you can build whatever your imagination has. And this one just makes it great. Unboxing that is phenomenal. I go, I'm going to take well, one last question from the audience. Um, so someone said, what's a, uh, what's a good approach to lighting an interior from scratch? <laughs> There's still like, I got more. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want a whole course in the last one minute of this podcast. Come on, Sean. What's the secret for lighting an interior from scratch? Uh, one, try to get, uh, an idea of what you want. So you make a mood board if you need to at first, if you're doing this, I, I don't know your pipeline. I don't know if you have a concept artist, you have access to get them if you need them. Um, uh, scout your area too. I mean, if you, you I, I don't, are you like, you're thinking for ICV effects was a question related Probably. to ICV effects, was it? Or virtual, board? I'm not sure if it's games or, um, but yeah. whatever you do, do you have a reference point? get a mood board, get a concept artist. If it's, if it's filming, you can virtual scout. And what I mean by that is one, look at your actual objective scene, take pictures of it ahead of time. Also, um, in virtual scouting too, you can build your set using VR tools and you can set that stuff up and then the director can switch things around the way you want, but know what you want ahead of time, know exactly mm-hmm. how you want to light it, how you want it to look. And then play with some different looks and feels. Mess with your color palette. Um, <clears throat> I teach a class where we go over how to do a 3D LUT. Um, if your final output, you can do, if you know someone who's a color scientist, they can do OCIO to help encode and, and, and get things adjusted the way that you need. Otherwise, just look at your references. Look at your references for your lighting. Figure out what you want. And then make several different versions of them. And then you can decide which one you think is the best carrying out that dramatic feel that you want. Like, I mean, evening to daytime to nighttime, do exactly what illustrators do. They, here's my evening shot. Here's my nighttime. And they draw them. They draw. Here's my evening. Here's my nighttime. Here. There's a reason why they do that. Because then if the director tells them that I need a daytime, a nighttime, an evening shot, they have all those reference points. They can draw it and render it. And you can do the same thing with Unreal. I do want to teach a course where it's like Unreal and how to use a concept art, use it for concept art. I just mm. haven't got around to it where you can just throw things in, do the lighting, and then take it in Photoshop and use it as a paint over. Um, right. But uh, yeah, there's a lot you can do with that. Hopefully it answers that question. I try to answer that as much as I can, but I also threw a bunch of probably way too much crap information. No, it's a great point. It's, I, I think where I always get to is with – artists on my team or students or whatever it is like when they say to me does this is this right or does this look good i'm like i look at it and go i don't know what do you think or what's it supposed to look like that's my first question what's it supposed to look like because i could say yeah it looks good but i don't know what it's supposed to look like and then, yeah, then, yeah. then that brings up the question of well where's your reference and if they say i don't have any reference then we have a conversation <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah that's um, a great there was a question like, where do I teach? So right now I, I teach for Unreal ILT, which is instructor led training. That's our corporate. So we teach corporate, we teach companies. Uh, we don't, we used to have it where we had on site where people would come to WeWork and we would open it up to anybody who wanted to sign up for the classes, but COVID smashed that. So we lost that. Um, so now we just focus mainly on ILT and, and, and again, instructor led training for corporate America. So if you do have a company you belong to, you can reach out to us at training at epicgames.com 
and then you can just say, hey, we're interested. And I'm going to give these guys some props because this is CG Pro. This is authorized. Uh, uh, they have authorized trainer and they're a partner here. And they definitely have an amazing group of teachers and instructors. And some of them I've helped work with and train and they're phenomenal. So they have to be amazing. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but uh, these guys the have best a great. Ones. These guys have a great setup too. So we like to work with them as much as possible. All the different partners because we want to be able to just get the masses empowered. So wherever you find your training, wherever you find your spot, just keep that in mind. This you know, just just make sure you know what you want to learn and then <laughs> dive in. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words there as well. Um, no problem. Yeah. So, uh, to wrap, I'd love to hear what your, what your, what are you most excited about right now? Mm. So we're trying to do several things in our department and we're, we're really trying to listen, put our ear to the ground and listen to the client. So training wise, um, we're unboxing a bunch of new classes that we had. And what I'm really excited is just where lighting is going and virtual production it's just getting better and better and better. Like you'll see when you're in Unreal, you'll notice it says like uh, ray tracing is deprecated. Mm -hmm. That's because we have, if you can probably figure it out that we're grabbing some of that tech from ray tracing and we're trying to get it to, 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 to give us even better visuals. And, um, and you'll see that cause you'll see the switches in Unreal. So I'm not telling you anything new. You'll actually see where you can mix and match your lighting options in there. So it's just going to get better and better as we merge things together. Cause right now in Unreal, you can light things six different ways. And if you don't know anything about lighting, that'll melt your brain and slat out your left ear canal. Like there's, ah, <laughs> that's like a lot of different ways to do it. So we're hopefully we're going to start unifying some of that. And it also caters to the customer because we have customers that do phones, they do automotive, and they may favor ray tracing over something else. So that's why we kind of left them open on purpose right now. So eventually we're going to, that's going to get better, but I'm really excited about the lighting possibilities for virtual production and also uh, a lot of cool stuff I can't talk about, <laughs> unfortunately. There's a lot of cool tools we're working with and we want to get done. And I'm really excited to be able to, uh, implement that in some of our teaching amazing <laughs> that's all i can say really <laughs> no I, I i totally get I it i really tell, want to tell, tell us all your secrets i love my job <laughs> <laughs> it comes across yes i uh, don't want to i feel i feel no no completely don't get in trouble um so uh just just to wrap is there anything that you'd like to share with our community anything where pe people can follow what you do or uh, see anything that you've is there anything you want to share with the community oh um, man i haven't kept up my website or my blogs i just don't haven't had time um i used to have a youtube channel but i just stopped doing it because anything i do with the videos i have to make sure i'm clearing it with epic mm. games um you will see me maybe once in a while on different podcasts i just want to make sure that i have to clear that also to make sure that everything's really hush hush at epic because we want to make sure that the tech that we're developing that it's ready and we don't want to release anything like any corporate company don't want to release things too soon i would say advice if i can give anything advice to those that want to dive in and learn and really want to understand this stuff the best advice i can tell you and you probably heard it a thousand times from your college professor or your art teacher or whatever is practice makes perfect try to practice as much as possible try to learn as much as possible and one of the big things i've always told my students when i used to teach is passion be passionate about what you do and I, I heard some guy on LinkedIn say like, oh, you, if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. He thought it was a bunch of BS. But honestly, I think it's true. If you love what you I do, do it's a pleasure to do it. it. You are working at it, but that's the thing. Find that that spot in your heart where you really love what you do and really feel passionate about it. And it will you'll just take off. Like there's nothing you can't do. I, I echo you completely and, and thank you for sharing that with everyone because I, I think it's fantastic advice and I totally agree with you. I think that you should find something that you love because you spend so much of your life working that you, you, you better do something that you like. I know and, and it does. If you, I think if you have something that's worth fighting for in your life that you want to fight for and something that, that you, you feel willing to do a 12-hour day for, whether you do or not, 
that's, that's when you know you are, you're onto something. And I, I love your passion. I love your spirit. Thank you, Sean, so much for. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure, man. Yeah, thanks for being on. I feel like we had probably three or four more podcasts that we could have got. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we get to have you back if we can clear it. Yeah, clear. yeah. I'll, 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 uh, I'll make sure I throw it towards legal to me. <laughs> can Sean talk today? Is he out of the cage today? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy that you were, you had a day out of the cage and that you could come and spend it with us. <laughs> All right, Thank thanks, you. man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. I appreciate it too. And thank you also to everybody out there who was listening in today. We had some great questions. Uh, thank you all for sharing this time with us. Um, we've been CG Pro. You'll see us again in another couple of weeks with another episode. Um, we do have a, a games, game design in Unreal course, which is coming up on the 4th. So it's only a few days away. If anyone's interested in that, jump on board. Um, so our Unreal Engine games training. But um, yeah, that's it. Thank you all again. Been a great night and awesome. we look forward to seeing you soon. All right, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. See you on the other side. Take care. Good night, everybody.